Cass Haley, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good, man. How about you? Oh, I'm great, man. I, I like the scenic background with the guitar and everything. So I'm just curious, man. How's the whole quarantine situation been for you? Uh, it seems like it's never going to end. Um, yeah. When this whole thing began, uh, it was sort of a shock. I liked it with everybody, and we. I'm a big believer in trying to be prepared. You know what I mean. We live out here in the country, so when this, when the, when the words on the streets were like that, there was this pandemic. I was definitely sort of like, you know, we live 30 miles from town, so I was like, man, we need to limit limit the amount of time that we go into the city and stuff and yeah. into town. So we stocked up on a bunch of stuff, and that lasted us. And we literally stayed out on the farm for a month or two without going back um, to town, and. Uh, since then, it's just been, it's, it's a little bit, it's definitely weird for us, but I'm trying to keep my faith and trust in science and follow all the guidelines and just trying to do, uh, just give everything due process like it needs. My wife has, has an, a compromised immune system as well. She's a, a cancer patient. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's been tough. I think the toughest thing really, though, has been um, psychologically. Mm -hmm. not being able to fulfill plans and to make plans. We're such a, we're such a, uh, I'm a plan oriented guy and it's usually, I know what I'm going to be doing six months out and you know, I'm looking forward to travel and all that stuff. So it's been, it's been challenging dealing with that, but it's also been cool because we've taken the opportunity to, uh, zip up any projects. It's balance. Yeah, I'll say this. Part of me is kind of relieved with the whole toilet paper situation because that was a big scare right in the beginning with toilet paper and toilet shoes were running <laughs> out. You never really appreciate the small things in your life and until you lose toilet paper and then you you, know, you start right. scavenging. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's uh it's a, it's, it's weird. And I mean, it's easy to gripe at people for going and get extra toilet paper, but at the same time, do you blame them? I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like shit. It's uh that's sort of like the messiness of freedom. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it, it's, it's, we're crazy as shit here in America, man. There ain't yeah. no doubt about it. You know what? I was one of those people, like I was really low on toilet paper and then when it started finally coming back, I'm like, I'm not going to be one of those people that are hoarding it. And then I find myself like grabbing a lot of it just in case it happens again. <laughs> and I'm I like, know. oh man, I'd be going. <laughs> I know. I mean, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't tripping too bad on toilet paper just because like the sort of naturalist in me was like, oh, well, we can always just go down to the pond <laughs> you know, and, and wash up yeah. or use leaves or something. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. we'll be we're reusing dish rags. Obviously we didn't, we didn't do that, but I was like, that's where my head was going. I was oh, like, yes. oh, well we can do this. I was more concerned with like food storage, dry goods, um, just things to, because it's Cassie's situation, I was just concerned about like basic survival stuff. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's tough, dude. It's it's weird. It's tough, but so, it looks like everybody, even as bad as it is, it feels like we're gonna get a grip on how we're gonna live through this and in yeah. this, yeah, and still be able to have community and still be able to have connections like this. And uh, I have I have faith in science and I have faith in the goodness of mankind and I think that we're gonna. I think we're going to get through this, man. Oh, yeah. I definitely believe that. And I've seen that you've been still keeping yourself busy under the quarantine. You actually posted some videos of you working on a treehouse project. So did that ever get finished? Man, so that was, I started the, we started the treehouse this last winter. And it, it was, uh, it was my daughter's fourth grade project. We do like, a, we, we homeschool. We've been homeschooling for about, uh yeah about eight years mm -hmm. and um so in fourth grade there's a big big project that's surrounding um her studies and measurement and stuff like that and so we started in the fall and we're not we're not finished just yet once the we were we were scheduled to be finished this spring and then the pandemic hit and all of the funds that were allotted to to finish the treehouse went to oh shit 
mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let's wait our spinning. So I'm actually looking at it here. I'll turn the camera. Yeah. I'm looking at it. You might be able to see it down there. Oh, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if you could see it. Yeah. But uh, but my daughter asked me the other day. She's like, Dad, we have to finish this treehouse. Come on. So I'm thinking that we're gonna start back up here in the next couple of weeks. I'm probably about. I'm a good like six or seven days out. If I worked on it for six or another week, it'd be finished. So, no, it's a sweet treehouse. I mean, besides what you just showed me, I mean, from the postings I saw earlier, yeah, that looks like it could be someone's apartment right there, dude. And that's sort of the plan. The, yeah. We have a lot of friend. We have a lot of friends that pass through. So I was like, it's so much easier to have guests when you actually have the setup where they don't have to be in your space, you know, yeah. too much. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the Airbnb spot right there, man. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Come out to the farm and work on the work in the garden, and you oh, see yeah. the treehouse. People will probably pay you to stay <laughs> there and farm just so they can, you know, have that experience. Well, dude, one thing, one one of my visions for the farm here, you know, dude, we moved out here about 13 years ago, and there was nothing here. You know, it was just a, a hill of no grass on the hill. Um, and we built everything from the house, everything we've done, we did ourselves. We lived in a camper and the vision, the vision has evolved over the future. At first it was just providing a home for my family. Mm -hmm. And now I've got an area that I've built for the studio and I hope to be able to host other artists and people out here you know to have a farm experience and to be able to record albums and you know we have we have about 27 acres so i want to build little cabins and stuff all around it and hey who knows maybe it'll be a good retirement for the kids but it's okay. fun dude i i absolutely love building and creating whether it's a song or a tree house or mm -hmm. or whatever i'm just in i'm in into the act of creation i love it oh man that's awesome well, before this pandemic, man, you actually previously won Lincoln's Charger Course competition. So how's that experience been for you so far? Dude, it's been, uh, it's hard to ex explain how incredible and exciting the whole, the whole experience has been. I, uh, you know, the story is, is pretty, uh, when I, when I tell it, I just, you know, I can't believe that it all happened the way that it did and that we're here today and that, you know, I mean, I'll start, start with the, the song, the song, every road I'm on. So chart your course is a songwriting competition that Lincoln, um, announced last at the, at the end of last summer. Mm -hmm. And, um, last summer I was on the road and I wrote this tune called every road I'm on, which was inspired by our family's journeys and our family trying to be able to find our sanity while traveling and, and being away from our home and being on the road, being able to find our presence, you know, without getting too stressed out uh, about where we had to be or, you know, how it is when you're not present in your life and you're not able to experience what you're actually experiencing. You're caught up in your head. Yeah. So the, the, the tune was about, was about that. And it was, you know, just sort of, keeping keeping presence in your life and also just being reminded that no matter what happens no matter what road you're on no matter what tragedy you're going through that the blessings of life are your reaction to it and your ability to be present within that mm -hmm. so and so it was a simple song my family would sing on the road and it was written last summer a few months uh in in october of 2019 a few months after the song was written I was on my way to a concert in Minneapolis to play with Manish Yahoo and this group called Wookie Foot. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and my wife were flying up there. I was going to play it um, with a group up in Minneapolis. And, and I saw this Instagram ad. And uh, man, I never really pay attention to the sponsored ads. And I, I, definitely, I definitely don't give much thought into it to competitions like songwriting competitions and things that you have to like, I don't know. I sort of got burnt. Yeah. I felt like over the competition thing after America's got talent yeah. and I just, I wasn't into that competition when I entered that one. And, uh, I've just never, I've never been one that was really gung ho about being judged 
<laughs> by people, you know what I mean? And like just that whole thing. So, so, but this competition, man, and the, and the, the videos that they had really resonated with me. Um, it had a really deep vibe and, a, and it was filmed in a really cool way. Uh, they used like all like vintage film and like super eight stuff. And it was like, it had this kind of, you know, artist, like the true artist path and how like, it's sort of a mystical journey, you know, this, this, this artist way and to be able to write songs. And it had a very, um, I, I always say that it had a very hero's journey kind of vibe to it, you know, mm-hmm. of charting your course into the unknown and going out and just paving your own path, following your dreams. And it was really done well. And um, I looked at Cassie and like the, the instant I saw it, I read through, I went and read through the, uh, the rules and everything. And I, and I just had this feel and I was like, man, we have to enter this competition. Um, I just, I knew it in my bones, man, that we were going to win this, at least a finalist spot. And I've, Mm -hmm. I am, I'm, I'm a fairly confident person, but I've never known, like I've never had such a premonition or such a feeling of like sureness. And, uh, I'm getting the notification that I was picked as a finalist and I didn't realize what was about to happen in the rules of the final. When, when I first auditioned, it was just like, um, the only thing that I knew that I was going to get was I was going to get a cash prize. And I was going to get a chance to be in a commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I got the phone call from, um, from the, uh, the ad agency and, and Lincoln, the, the people that built the competition, uh, they sort of discussed what the plan was. And they're like, cast. they're like, we'd like to send a film crew to your house to tell your story about your song and your family. And then we would like for you and, and your family to come to LA and go to the Grammys and some of this content is going to air during the, during the, uh, the, uh, broadcast of, of the Grammy awards. And I was like, you know, I, all of that information, I was like, holy, sh- holy uh-huh. shit, man. Wow. Like, well, <laughs> like what do well, this is, this is incredible, yeah. you know? Um, and so there was like a, so they showed up to our farm I thought there was going to be a couple guys with cameras and they showed up with Hollywood, bro. I mean, it was like, wow. uh, Paris, you know, I don't think Paris had experienced, um, that before my, the little town that I lived close to, you know, they had a, they had a, about 30 people on their crew. They oh, shut wow. down, they shut down our County road and they had, you know, it was, wow. it was, it was pretty cool. And they were here for like three or four days filming. And, um, uh, what was interesting about the whole thing is their attention to the story. It was, it was, it was about the story. It was, and, you know, and I was like, I was thinking the whole time of where is the car, what is the car play into this, you know? And, yeah. and it's really, it's really more about a feeling and it's about the story of being able to find your presence and to be able to find your well being as a human being and that we're all going through this tough stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, it seems like that they were interested in telling our story as is, which is a pretty incredible opportunity um, being doing what I do to have a company like Lincoln come and tell your story honestly and do such a good job, you know. So, um, yeah, it's been really crazy. And then the next phase, we ended up winning the whole competition. And um, and then from there, man, the journey just got even crazier. Yeah, I could I couldn't believe that it just kept on getting more exciting and more crazy. So the the next thing that happened after we you know let me tell about the experience winning. So the ambassador and the main mentor of the competition, the face of the chart your course competition, is John Batiste. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with who John Batiste is, but John Batiste is this virtuoso piano player, jazz. Um, just amazing touched human being. He's the music director on Stephen Colbert. Um, he, he was the main ambassador in the face of the, of the competition. And the day they announced, I really didn't get nervous up until like a few moments before they announced who won. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. It was interesting how emotional I got, uh, because I, this whole 
the whole process, I felt really informed and confident about how to win this and about doing everything that I could, um, that I had learned over the years to be able to create visibility for me in this competition and, and to, and to show with my fans and, uh, you know, I felt like I had all the tools to win this and I felt really confident in, in all of that. And then when it all came to an end moments before they announced two one, you know, I had this, I had this, my first sort of cathartic experience where I had overwhelming emotions that I can't even explain me. And I've never, I've never had, full body like emotional experiences yeah. and it was just sort of like i really wanted to win this yeah and 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 it was i i didn't even realize how bad i wanted and needed to win this thing until i had that moment of like body shaking sort of tears oh. you know what i mean of like yeah and it, and you know and maybe it was like you know coming from a place of where my career has been a little unorthodox where, you know, I've had a combination of, you know, live performance and touring over the last 15 years, mm -hmm. but then I had America's got talent and, you know, I was really for years, I was really insecure about my biggest accomplishment being America's got talent, yeah. you know, being some, being some TV show that a lot of people would say silly and a lot of people, you know, would, Really, you know, at least in my mind, the type of person I am, most of the time when, I, when, when there's reality TV show people and, and artists, myself, I'm like, eh, you know what I mean? Could they really be a real artist if they're on one of these TV shows? Yeah. That's, like, that's like the loop that's in my head. So I was sort of a victim of that kind of perspective for myself, and it created an insecurity in me where it was like, I don't want to be defined by the heavy brand of America's Got Talent and the world of this sort of commercial, like cookie cutter, sell you like a Pepsi can type of thing. Uh, yeah. It all boils down to now. This is Cass's big shot. You yeah. know what I mean? It's <laughs> like they have this like hardcore defining kind of thing where it's like, this is your only shot here on this TV show, you know? Yeah. And, uh, part of the reason why, you know, so, so there was this, there was this sort of insecurity inside of me to prove myself a, as something other than just, um, just some TV show guy, like my last name, literally for five years, it was Cass Haley from America's Got Talent. <laughs> it was like, you know, yeah. and, and, and half of the people would be like, Oh, you're that dude from American Idol. Huh? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, and and I would just say, yeah, you know, I wouldn't do yeah. that or anything. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, actually, so you think you can dance, <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's, 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 uh, I just know the power of labels mm -hmm. and the power the power of generalizing and the power of like, you know, we put, we do, we put, we put all so many things in boxes, whether it's like, uh, if you're, if you're into reggae music and you're a reggae artist um, and you're not, you know, but someone looks at you and, and you don't have dreadlocks and you're not saying yeah. Ja and Rastafari, they're yeah. like, Whoa, what is this? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, they, we have all these sort of typecasts and I yeah. hate that shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm totally not into it. Um, uh, I think it limits our experience with these things. So, so when I'm having that, cause going back to winning this, it was like a, it was like, it took me 13 years to do something that I felt was, uh, showed my true artistry and showed like the potential of what I'm doing that maybe could overshadow, you know, and over sort of, and it was my own story told by us. And it didn't have any kind of uh, weird filter on yeah. it, you know. And it's yeah. um, so so. It was just this really emotional experience as I won. Um, and after that, I started on this road trip. And the idea of the road trip was to we started in LA, went to Austin in this new car that I won, and we met up with different. Um, individuals mentors actors artists musicians and the idea was to tell my story um firsthand with these people and get advice and see what they could bring to the table and offer me um on on my journey 
And so one of the first, one of the first people we met up with in Austin was Matthew McConaughey. And it was, dude, you know, it was, it was like watching a movie while I was there talk, <laughs> having this conversation with him. It was like, I've watched so many of his movies that I was like, yeah. Yeah. I was like, and there's, and, it, and this, basically we met up, we met up at this really cool boutique hat shop in Austin, Texas. And he had me a hat made. And as they were making my hat, we sat down on the couch and we sort of just talked story and just, oh, nice. I told, I told him, you know, uh, about my family and about me trying to create balance with, you know, career and family. And we talked about that and all kinds of other good stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was incredible, man. It was, uh, that dude is every bit, the dude's got the mojo for sure. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, you meet some people and you're like, huh? But with him, it was like, okay, totally get it. This oh, dude, oh man, this dude is the most self-directed. He's super brilliant, super smart. As funny as he comes off sometimes with his sort of arm, sort of hippie sort of thing going yeah. on. But dude, he's like, uh, he's got the mojo, and it was, it was real. It was real inspiring. I, I felt like a star just sitting by him. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it was cool and it was cool to get his take on it. He travels with his family as well. Oh, okay. And he, he had a lot of, uh, uh, advice and stuff about how to keep it together and keep mm. it, keep it balanced. And then from there, um, I met with a few, uh, uh, another singer songwriter in Austin. And then we went down to new Orleans and, um, I got to meet with some incredible new Orleans musicians, singer songwriters. I got to meet with, um, tank from tank in the bangas. Okay. who's a Gram- Grammy nominated um soul uh hip hop group and uh got to jam with uh the legendary John Cleary who I'm a huge fan of and who is uh just a ambassador of traditional New Orleans jazz and music mm-hmm. um I got to uh hang out and jam with uh Chawa which is a Mardi Gras sort of New Orleans funk a uh, group they do it they dress up in the tr- all the traditional Mardi Gras native sort of garb you know um and it was really cool man and then and then the the competition the the road trip circles back around and goes back to LA where I uh go to Capitol Studios and record with the legendary producer engineer Mr. Al Schmidt mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of people you know if you're not super into the history and the engineering side of music, you might not know who Al is, but you've definitely, your life's been affected by the work that he's done because he's recorded everybody from Paul McCartney to Sam Cooke to Frank Sinatra. He literally, you know, interned with the guy that created the fader on a board, you know, uh, Tom Dowd. He was with Tom Dowd for 10 years. Tom Dowd created the fader versus it used to be all knobs. Mm. and and it, it's it's hard to to operate knobs yeah. all at the same time so yeah. like the the fader was this vibe where they could turn multiple things up at once you yeah. know so yeah. this guy is like a part of history oh yeah um yeah and so we we ended up taking all the advice that we got along the way and the song sort of you know uh, evolved into a brand new thing and we recorded it at Capitol Studios and the, the incredible thing about all this is all of this is filmed and all of this is going to be featured in special content and a short film mm-hmm. that's going to be that's going to be released in conjunction with some of the commercials and the campaign yeah so dude i mean who who could ask for anything more than that i mean it's like it's incredible, you know, so this stuff's supposed to start kicking up here at the beginning of September. So, you know, meeting Matthew McConaughey must have been like the icing on the cake on top of everything, man. I mean, I've seen a lot of his movies and I would assume Surfer Dude that he was in is probably the closest to how he actually <laughs> like his real personality. I tell you what, man, I mean he's got a very strong character and he he's not quite as laid back as he's not quite as laid back as some of the, um, like what's the movie in Austin, one of his first hits. Uh, uh, I forgot what the, uh, dazed and confused. Right. Okay. So he's, he's in dazed and confused. And in that he's like, you're super cool, dude. And he is super cool, but you can tell that the dude, the dude is legit. And there's no, I mean, I think he's the kind of guy, and this is just my take on it. 
yeah. he's sort of like Sean Penn, where he's like the kind of guy that like, I don't think he auditions for parts. You know <laughs> what I mean? I think like you like you want you hire him and he comes and does exactly what he wants to do. Yeah. And it's usually really good. And that's that. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. that's the vibe I got. Self directed. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bet. I bet. And yeah, I saw the videos for the, you know, the competition and it, it looked like you were, you know, a movie star, man. Like from what I, it looked like you were the star of your own movie in itself. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it blows my mind. Yeah. Wait, I can't wait for people to see the, yeah. the short film because it tells the complete story. Oh, yeah. Well, and you talked about Every Road I'm On, which you recently came out with this EP with three songs on it. So do you want to share what fans can expect from this new album? Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, the EP was released um, like last Friday, Friday before last. And so in the end, it's going to be a part of the new album as well. Okay. So those, those songs will be included on the new album. The new album's called All the Right People. And it's gonna, we're gonna start releasing singles from the new album um, this fall. And <clears throat> the new album was, um, was definitely inspired by what, what, it, what has happened with Lincoln and Chart Your Course. And uh, mm -hmm. right after the, the road trip, I organized a, a session here on the farm where I brought in all of my favorite musicians that I have met and built relationships with over the years. And I brought in one of my favorite engineers and music producers mr rob for boney rob is uh his discography includes everything like from bob dylan to to eric clapton to bob marley to uh joe cocker to bonnie rayett um he's he produced the last waltz the band um he has just a really really deep history and he has a great understanding about capturing real moments sort of old style recording ambient miking and I've always had a love for the purity of something of like knowing that people were together at one moment in time. It's like when you look at a National Geographic, you know that that's not that's a real picture. Yeah. That's not a that's not a filter. It's not hasn't really been edited. That that's like a real picture, and that's like a real representation of what's going on right then. Yeah. I I have this. Uh, I, I love that in music as well, and that's what attracts me to old style music. Whether you're listening to Little Richard or you're listening to old jazz records where you can hear the people in the room and you can feel those recordings are alive. Yeah. So the, the idea of this new album was to make a recording that is alive and that is real moments in time with real people that uh, I've built relationships with that I care about and that are some of, in my opinion, some of the best musicians that I've came across and some of the best people I've came across. So the album has this sort of like, you know, purist sort of approach and also trying to honor all of the relationships and bring all these people in to the story as well and, and give the listener that experience. So what we did with all the right people is we also, while we were, while we were recording it, we filmed and recorded seven different podcasts for each person that was involved. Mm. So you get it. So you get a backstory of where they came from, what their story is, how we met. And, um, you start to see, you know, that like our success as human beings really lies in our relationships and what they mean to us and how they're, how they're honored and how they're managed that it's like nothing good happens with just one person. Yeah. And, and sort of that's the story of the album is just honoring all of our relationships and trying to make it as real as possible where people can feel the vibe of the collective, you know? Yeah. You know, I was going through it last night and it's a great EP. I'm a big fan of the third track because I used to live in New Orleans. So, and I like the Cajun style of music that you implemented in, in, in the EP. But yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of all your music, man. It, it's amazing. Thanks, man. I, yeah. I really like this EP. So you like, you like the capital version. Oh like yeah, the, cap the capital sessions, dude. Yeah, me too. I, I it, you know, and it, it, the three different versions of the song is also it, one. One of the reasons that there's three different versions is because I really couldn't make my mind up. And another, another is that you know the lyrics are sunshine, rain, or storm. It's all the same. Blessings yeah. always come rearranged, and it sort yeah. of plays into the lyrics of like, you know, whatever. Pick your poison, whatever you like. You know, here's three different options. Yeah, you know. No, it's a great EP.
And you actually did a live stream when the record actually dropped. So how did that go? The live stream was cool. You know, it was the first time that we had played live since, uh, since COVID and the pandemic and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just trying to pivot and trying to, trying to connect. And, and, uh, since we can't actually play concerts, um, you know, we're just trying to figure out new ways to be able to connect. So it was a live, it was a page, uh, streaming concert and it went over really good, you know, and, uh, it was, it was extremely fun and I hope to be able to do it, uh, you know, more often. I mean, I don't know how often people are gonna, you know, pay attention. So we'll see, I might do it once every six weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it was fun and it was definitely better than not playing at all to be able to connect and to be able to chat with people as they're watching it and to be able to, you know, interact and, um, the family joined the concert as well. So that was really fun for the kids. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, hopefully out here too, you know, whether it's like a hundred people or whatever, um, little mini festivals, you know? Yeah. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's all that sort of getting lined out. No, I would love to like see some more live streams from you. I know you I posted some other stuff playing in front of the camera, but yeah, I would love to see some more live streams. Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do another one um August uh 19th uh for bands in town. I think it's gonna be around two PM, but I'll I'll get you the info and stuff on that too. Yeah, that'll be awesome. And you were writing music on some previous songs with your wife. So did she play any part in this new EP or this upcoming album that you were talking about? Yeah, she's one of she's one of the main all the right people. <laughs> she's uh, she is uh she co wrote the entire album. Um, you know, the entire album we wrote together over this last like six months, uh, to a year. And that really what's crazy about, you know, the, sh- the, the competition inspired us pulling the trigger and, and go ahead and record an album. But what was really cool is that we released an album last summer and usually it takes me a couple of years to have the inspiration to even write the songs. But mm-hmm. This, this last fall of 2019 was just super inspiring. And Cassie was like, she was like a fountain of ideas. And so we, you know, by, by the time Christmas rolled around 2019, we pretty much had um, a group of songs that we felt was special and that we wanted to record. So uh, yeah, man, she played a huge role in this. And a, lo- a lot of these songs are um, a big part of her story. Hmm. So it's really, it's really exciting. So what got you two interested in writing music together in the first place? Dude, I would have never imagined us writing songs together. And then uh, she, she just started having, you know, she just started becoming inspired and having ideas and she would share them with me and stuff and ask me, you know, if, if, they, if I thought they were good. And then the next thing you know, I was, helping her work through some ideas and finishing it and stuff. And, um, I just felt like our ideas together were so much better than just my ideas. I was like, I just felt like it was a, it was magical because, you know, it's like, at I, and it, it's really a lesson on, you know, the collaborative sort of effort on how that like these creations that we have are all can be, you know, it's always nice to have a creation of your own, yeah. and stuff but it's so much more enjoyable in my opinion for it to be a collaborative effort because you can enjoy you can enjoy other people's work without it you know getting too much in your head and your own ego of your own creations it's sort of embarrassing to like enjoy your own creations like you no. know yeah jam i listen to my album all the time man <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's a weird space to be in right yeah. so it's like yeah. there's some there's some some grace and some beauty in sharing that creation with other people. It's just like a good movie too. It's like, you know, we love watching a good movie, but it's always better watching a good movie with someone else that you can talk about it with. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, man, it's just been a really awesome way to bring our family even closer together too, to have these collaborative creations and bring it, bring it back to this like sort of holistic kind of thing where things aren't as fragmented and we still like to have our individual lives and, you know, I understand the importance of all that, but I think the more, the more things that you can like make a part of the whole in your family, like whether it's work and family and like making those two things sort of a hybrid where they can work with, within each other, 
is, is uh, for me, the path. You know, it's like I like to include my children and my family in all that I do just because I know that the time that I have with them is so limited. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To, yeah. Before too long, it's going to be over, bro. Yeah. You know, and so it's like the most important thing is the relationship, you know? No, that's interesting. And what's really interesting is, and you mentioned earlier that you bring your family on tour with you. So how are you able to balance that life of being a family man and also a musician who's, you know, working on tour at the same time? I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely hard, you know, and it's definitely something that touring for so many years before without my family, without my wife, um, it was a hard transition to figure out how to do how, and I'm still figuring it out. You know what I mean? But I think one of the things that you have to realize is that, you know, you can only put your attention in so many places at once. So if, if you can integrate them into one thing, you can, you can maximize, yeah. you know, where your attention is with both, but you do, you know, I've, I've sort of faced the reality that, you know, there's certain things that I might not do in my career because it's not worth the sacrifice and there's certain there's an amount of time that i i I sort of i'm on the career sort of path of like i'm on the long-term plan you know what i mean it's like i'm looking at my career and my family's relationships as a longevity kind of thing of like how do we pursue this in a way that's good good for my music and will support us but good for the family as well so i think it's like working through all of those things and also making sure that 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 is in line with like realistic what your output's going to be for your input like re- realizing that you know if i i'm not going to be able to tour 300 days a year and have a normal family life yeah. and that's not that's not what i'm looking for you know i'm looking for having a balanced approach over a long period of time um you know having a normal life where i can mow the lawn and take care of animals and have like normal human experiences that isn't just transient sort of things. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's just, I think it's about, for us, it's been about like, we have an inspiration about what we want to do. And so whether some kind of tour, you know, we've refined the kind of places that we want to play that are in line with like experiences that I would want my family to have. So we're trying to do earlier shows. Okay. We're trying to we're trying to do shows that aren't really centered in you know booze. Not that I don't have a problem with drinking or anything, yeah. but it's like man, you know the the days of playing uh, a bar that has a stage. Like I really am not into it. You know, yeah. I would rather yeah. I would rather play uh, some kind of art co op that yeah. where people drink coffee and there's a hundred people yeah. than play a five hundred yeah. uh, person bar where everybody's trashed. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, and, and, and that's cool too, dude. Cause at a certain, at a certain point in my life, I was playing those places and loving it. And I just think it's about refining and like self-directing of like what you want your experience to be as a musician. It's like, dude, there's, there's all these systems set in place for musicians of like tours and the type of that a lot of the perspective is this, that you've got to go out there and you've got to tour two, three months at a time, one, you know, what. And, and that's really hard. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's really hard for me. And I've realized that that's not my plan. I'm not going to go out and tour for two months at a time, uh, at this point. Now that could change if the right scenario happened, if if, if all of a sudden we could afford a tour bus and a driver and all these things that would make that kind of touring easier. Yeah. But, um, you know, what we've done is we've just refined our approach. We've made our lists and we say, Hey, we don't want to go back to this venue. We don't want to experience this. We want to experience this, 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 and this. We want to try to do shows earlier. So we've just sort of like, you know, creating our own, our own thing and directing our own career in the way that we want it to be. And whether or not it's successful, uh, I think depends on our experience of it more so than just the output, just the outcome. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's the goal of like, you know, what is our experience of these things? Are we enjoying this? If we're not, let's change that. Yeah. You know, and for many years, I, I kept banging my head against the same wall and not refining and wondering why things weren't changing. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a, a, a big, a big deal. It's like, you know, you try something, you look back, you refine it, then you go out and you try it a little bit differently. Yeah. 
I get it. You got to make a lot of sacrifices. You got to make your family happy, even though it's some things that you're not comfortable doing or some opportunities that maybe you could make more money. But ultimately, you got to take care of your family, especially if they're on the road. Yep. 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 And, and, and that comes, you know, it's just like my kids only enjoy being on the road so much. You know, it's the yeah. minute we're out there too long, it's like they're like over it, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's tough man it's a balance and we we don't have it figured out but i feel like we're moving in the right direction and you mentioned matthew mcconaughey brings his family with him as well so did he provide some advice for you that to really help you out i i mean i think the the advice was that that's the way that figure that figure that out (laughs) you know what i'm saying like it's 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 like that's the way yeah it's time and so you know you gotta gotta do it yeah, I get it. And I've gone through all your music, man. And you've had the your recent album, The Lessings and Blessings, which I saw that your barn mural was your inspiration for the cover art of that album. So why is that? Man, you know, um, our new sort of pursuit as like the family band and like sort of bringing all these fragments and pieces together and try, attempting to have this sort of holistic therapeutic approach to a music career and a family started with uh the album more music more family and that was like that was sort of like my prayer you know mm-hmm. more music more family was like my life was I was suffering in all kinds of ways. Uh, I had lost my voice. I was extremely unhealthy. I was pre-diabetic, pre-hypertension, very, you know, things were out of whack. Yeah. And a lot of that had to do with me making decisions based in fear versus inspired decisions. Meaning I was pursuing my career but I was taking any opportunity that would come regardless of whether or not it inspired me, whether or not I wanted to do it. So more music, more family was sort of when, you know, we well, can call it God, you can call it the universe, you can call it whatever, but I was taken out of the game. And I think it was a compound of, of I had a skiing accident, but it was also stress and emotional issues from being away from the family and seeing my family suffer and 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 all of that just sort of you know luckily I was faced with a situation where I could no longer go out on the road so it made me reflect on everything and you know lessons and blessings after more music more family you know we that was the beginning of us trying to create this new um process in which we pursue our career and our family life mm-hmm. and the barn mural was a painting that we did together you know we we painted that together as a family and it was one of our first sort of family creations and and our whole place our whole little you know uh farm has been created by all of us and it was sort of just uh um just a cool just a cool sort of uh symbol of that of that you know that that this whole little farm is a creation that we've all put our time and energy in together and that's a special thing. And we're going to try to continue to do that, you know, as, as for as long as we can of just collaborating together creatively and, and letting inspiration move us forward versus fear. And dude, that's a tricky thing Yeah. of like, it's a tricky thing to be able to tell the difference of where fear is creeping into your decision-making process. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like fear disguises itself in, in all kinds of ways of like, Oh, it's just rationale. Yeah, it just yeah. makes the most thing. And, and what I found to be the killer of opportunity is making decisions based on that versus like when you make a decision based on like, oh, yeah, I'm totally inspired to go out on the road with this band in this way. Um, no, it's not that much money, but I'm inspired about to do it. And those kind of scenarios where you stand on the edge. And it's a not, maybe it's not the most secure decision that you've ever made, but it's inspiring. Those kind of like, those kind of situations I've always had great success with. And, and the most rewarding outcome is when I'm facing those kind of, you're sort of facing those fears and you're not letting fear creep in of like, oh, Cass, you can't afford to do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and so it's a fine balance of like, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. But I encourage everybody 
to do it of like trying to take a good look and say, am I making this decision based out of fear or am I making this decision based out of inspiration? Do I really want to do it or am I just doing it because I'm afraid another one won't come along or I'm afraid that I won't have enough money if I don't do it, you know, yeah. you know, and the, the thing that I always try to remind myself is if I'm, if I'm making all the other right decisions, mean, meaning that I'm turning every stone, checking every box, my health, my emotions, my psychology, every, if, if I'm doing everything that I need to do, you know, when I get to that point of this, this, you know, sort of got to make this decision that's going to really, these sort of defining moments of like big opportunities or whatever, you know, I, I think that you have to make sure all that other stuff is in line to be able to, to make these kind of decisions yeah. to where it's like, so, so that you can be sure and have confidence in that space that you're saying, okay, I'm going to take this big risk because I'm inspired to do it. Yeah. You know, I think the clarity that you have to have up to that point is a big deal. So you can have confidence in that because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to inspire people to make stupid decisions, yeah. but I mean, dude, failing is a, is a part of it. Like that's a, you know, that's, I've failed most, most of the time. And I've, you know, that, it's like, I don't know. You just got it. You just got to rock and roll and you got to, you got to go with your inspiration and don't be afraid to fail. You know, you know, it's funny. I just saw like a quote the other day and says like the difference between a teacher and a student is a teacher is someone that's failed multiple times and learned from their failures. And a student is just someone that hasn't made any attempts yet. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. But, and you mentioned that you were actually, you lost your voice, which I heard was due to nerve damage, but you took some voice therapy to help it. So what are some practices that you routinely do now to really help with your voice? You know, uh, I think, you know, my overall health is, is, is my main focus and, and, and paying attention to my overall health to honor the relationship with my family has helped everything. So of course, you know, at the beginning stages of taking voice therapy and physical therapy, you know, there was all kinds of exercises, uh, voice exercises and warm ups and trying to change diet to a less acidic diet and all this stuff. But really what was the real problem with all of it is there was energetically all around, I was just completely out of whack. You know, I was 340 pounds. I was a, a, an asthmatic, pre-diabetic. So all of these things in my system were dysfunctioning. Yeah. And, and I fell down a mountain and hurt my neck. And, but I, you know, I'm not sure. I think, I don't know if the nerve damage alone for a healthy person would have had the same kind of effect that it had on me being super, super unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, you fast forward a couple years, uh, or, or, yeah, a couple years after the nerve damage in my neck and I had worked back up to being able to, I essentially had to relearn how to sing from a less compressed, less tension based sort of, um, uh, application because I really didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't learn how to sing, uh, at a school or anything, you know, I'd just been screaming and shouting since I was little and punk rock. And like, you know, I, I just sort of figured it out shooting from the hip. So I went to voice therapy and physical therapy, um, at UT Southwestern, which is a really great uh, medical, uh, college here and hospital in, in, uh, it's in DFW in Dallas. So I was making the trips to Dallas every time. And I was doing all this therapy and learning how to control my voice. And, uh, I got back to a point where I could, make the album more music, more family and sing, but I was still struggling a lot. Um, and then the big inspiration to sort of, I was for the last, you know, from, the, from the album, more music, more family all the way up till like 2018, which is two, I think at least two or three years, I still suffered and had a, had a lot of, had a lot of issues psychologically with my voice and physically um, and you know, everything really began to change when my wife got diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. because, you know, what we did when she got diagnosed with cancer is I remember the day we found out, I said, Cassie, you know, this is our golden ticket. 
to reclaiming our health. We have no, we, we, this is the real inspiration here. This is, this is our defining moment of saying, you know what, let's, since there's so much that's out of our control, let's take an inventory and see what is in our control. And me and her started, you know, doing everything that we could, including hiring, you know, great doctors and her going through traditional sort of uh, cancer therapy. We started doing everything we could on, on the side to just bring our general wellness and health up. So we started, we first started, we started fasting okay. and, um, by Walter Longo, who is at USC, that it was a study about chemotherapy in conjunction with fasting. And um, there's a book called The Fasting Mimicking Diet. Um, which is by Walter Longo that explains a lot of the the studies and stuff with um, with this. So we were inspired by that first, and that led to both of us really getting into fasting, prolonged and intermittent fasting. And um, within the first, you know, eight months of that, we had both, uh, you know, I'd lost Cassie had probably lost thirty pounds, and she wasn't that overweight. That's about all she needed to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had lost, you know, around like 60 to 70 pounds the first year and, um, or really within the first month. And then, you know, that led to just me continuing on at the same time. We weren't just fasting. We, we had cleaned our diet up to only be like, uh, cruciferous vegetables, green vegetables. My wife still ate some fruit and stuff, but I was like doing all green vegetables and just high end pastured meat. Yeah. trying to trying to provide as much of the protein from here on the farm, whether it's through hunting or we raise pigs. I'm um, just trying to keep it super, super simple and whole with our diet. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, since then it's been just over two years and, you know, I've lost, uh, over a hundred pounds and Cassie's cancer is gone. And, you right. know, thank God for right now, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you never all the way out of the door, especially with the cancer she has. So we've yeah. continued that kind of lifestyle where we, we fast and we keep our diet as whole and as clean as possible through pastured organic meats and organic homegrown vegetables as much as we possibly can. We don't eat three meals a day. You know, I eat one meal a day. Um, and we also, um, got into, you know, jogging and exercising and stretching and yoga and we also do a lot of ice baths, got into Wim Hof. Um, yeah. And, you know, the ice bath thing has been pretty amazing. Just not just because of like the, the, the effects of it after a workout to remove like the lactic acid and how that feels, mm-hmm. but also just like psychologically, like your, your serotonin levels and just like inflammation just all around. Yeah. Um, you know, I do every other day. Um, I jog about two to three miles and then I'll do like an ice bath with 40 pounds of ice outside. And I, I, I'm absolutely in love with it, man. Oh man. And I, uh, I also do some of the Wim Hof breathing stuff, you know, to oxygenate the system. And man, I'm just, I'm into like feeling good. And, and I, you know, we, we all have just, uh, tried to, find all the different things that'll, that'll, that'll help our lives and help us feel good, man. you know? And I follow Wim Hof and he mentions uh, to take the ice bath every day. So I don't know if that's something you, you mentioned you do it every day, but I do it, I do it every, I do it every other day in the okay. summer because of the ice becomes expensive for me. And the, the tap water is not cold enough to, sh- yeah. to like, I could, I could shower in a cold shower here in yeah. Texas and it'd be like 75 degree water, yeah. you know, but in the, in the winter, we have a pond that we do some plunges in. And then we also, I do do cold showers every day, yeah. you know, in the, in the winter, the water gets down to around 52 degrees, um, out of the tap. So I, I'm measuring and everything, yeah. you know, but, uh, I'm a believer, man. I really am. I would love to do an ice bath, but I don't have an ice machine. All I have is two ice trays, so it's not like I can Dude, do much. You you go to the corner store and you grab you like <laughs> fifty pounds of ice, man. Okay. I mean, they've got that's that's what I do. And what I was trying to figure out, I've got a deep freezer, and I was like, man, I need to like, I think I'm gonna start bagging up maybe gallon bags of water hmm. and just freezing my own ice 
you know, and then just sort of breaking it before. I, it, it's, yeah. it, it's sort of a lot. I would love yeah. an ice machine. I think we need an ice machine. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So, Cass, can we expect any more projects from you? Yeah, man. Um, I mean, I have all kinds of things that I want to do. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I've got a couple collaborations that are going to be coming out this fall that are going to be cool. That'll be on the side of the album. Uh, I, I can't say who they're with, but some pretty cool artists that I'm going to collaborate with. And then, uh, you know, I just wrote this new tune that I'm really stoked about. Um, I played it during my live stream. I'm probably going to release it as a separate sort of single called, it's called in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And it's about, you know, the emotional stress, psychological stress of what we're all going through with COVID and stuff. And, uh, I I I'm absolutely in love with this song, you know. It's got this sort of spooky. It's got this sort of spooky vibe to it and I think I'm going to release it around Halloween or something like that cuz okay. it's such a such a spooky song. <laughs> That'd be cool, man. So, we're at a recurring segment in this podcast called Name Your Bio. So, if you were to have an autobiography about your life, what would it be called and why? Ooh. You know, create It'd be create because I believe I believe that through creative action is the easiest to enter into being present with your life. So it's like whether you're jogging, whether you're gardening, whether you're working on a lawnmower, whatever creative action it is, you know, of like that movement. And, you know, I think that that's what makes art amazing is that it enables the vehicle for you to find presence in your life. Yeah. You know, um, real art, you know, where you're like not doing something for just an outcome. You're like, you're getting into the moment of what you're doing. I think that's, that's the flow state that everybody talks about. And I think that that's one of the most important things that anybody can do for themselves is to find that creative action. You know what I mean? And, and try to bring that into everything that they're doing. Now, it's amazing that you mentioned it. And just the other day, I was thinking, especially around this time, you know, a lot of people that I've been talking to is one thing they've really mentioned a lot that they've been doing is just creating. That's the key word that they've been using. And my personal theory is that everyone has the potential in being a creator. Not everyone does it, but everyone has the potential of being a creator themselves. And they need to you know, tap into that potential. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'd take it even one step further. Not everybody knows that they do it. Yeah. So I think, I think that there's so many instances where we're creating and we're not realizing. It's like yeah. even relationships are creative actions. Yeah. It's, it's like everything is a creative action. And it, it comes into you realizing and being cognitively sort of aware of your input and how you're affecting a situation through our reactions we are creating our future yeah. and I, I i take it i take it to that level that it's like everything you do you know you can it can be this creative endeavor you're creating your experience of it yeah you know and so i, I believe you know when I, i'm not a big religious person but you know when i hear religious people say that we were created in the image of God. Mm. I think of that, of the creator. Yeah. We're created in the image of the creator. Yeah. So yeah. what do we do? We create, you know, yeah. and that's our biggest gift as humans, man. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, that is amazing. Well, before we wrap, is there anything you want to share with our listeners? Man, I feel like I've shared it all. <laughs> but yeah, I would. It's like the one thing, you know, life is full of all kinds of bullshit, you know, and like everything that, that I'm talking about here is my attempt to make my life better. It doesn't mean that my life's not full of shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's all kinds of, I have a temper, I, all kinds of work that I need to do, all kinds of work that I'm doing. And that I really believe that we're all in the same boat, you know, and it's like, it's so hard to see that sometimes with social media and everybody cat putting out their highlight reel. And I do it too. I yeah. put my highlight reel out. I figure you've got enough bullshit in your life. 
that you don't need mine. But I want to tell you right now that I've got it too. And that all of these things are ideas and dreams that we're trying to bring into reality. So, you know, the, the thing is, it's just, I just want people to know that it's like, you know, it, it can be a sick being dream and all this stuff, you know, there's life so good or whatever. Just know that it's not. Yeah. You know, it's it. There's a bunch of bullshit too. And excuse my all my cussing. It seems like I get on these podcasts, and you know, uh, the sailor comes out in me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just like people to know that that it's like all of these, you know, all of these things. It's like it's like with what's going on. I don't know if you saw, you know, all of the stuff that's going on with uh, Nako. Yeah. Um, you know, and and it's 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 like that too. Of like, you know, Nako's been put on a pedestal. I'm not, I'm not condoning anything, but I think a big problem of the whole scenario was the pedestal he was put on instead of looked at like, you know, what knock was a young 20 year old rock star who's making some stupid decisions, you know, sometimes, um, that most of us are capable of making stupid decisions too. Um, and I just think that we, we have to stop. We have to realize we can't be putting everybody on these pedestals, you know? Yeah. We all should be on the same level. We all are, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, we're all d- going to die. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, man, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, Cass, I appreciate this conversation, man. I've been wanting to do this IRE chat with you for a while. So I'm glad that we have, we finally got a chance to do it. So from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate it so much. But Cass Haley, thank you so much for joining us in IRE chat and best of luck on everything. Thanks, brother. Thank you for having me.